that's different about this picture. Not the field, which is just like hundreds of others in the southwestern United States. Not the plane. You've seen a Curtis P-40 before. But there is something unique in the picture. It's the pilot. He could be Dick Brown from Sioux City or Frank Jones from Springfield. But he's not. He's Li Yen from Chongqing, China. This man is a Chinese air cadet, one of hundreds over here to take a postgraduate course in aviation, combat aviation. First class, English. Tough? Just as tough as it would be for any of us to learn Chinese. But these fellows take it in their stride. And blow as you see me do, everybody. I have written a sentence here using the letter P wherever it was possible. So I'm going to have you say for me, after listening to me, say this sentence with me. The pilot will presently place the plane properly, all together. The pilot will presently and every day these GIs from Shanghai, Nanking, and Hankow bone up on our finest, most modern equipment. You won't find a gold brick in this crowd because they come from a country which held off the Japs for six years with rusty rifles, obsolete planes, and plenty of guts. But now they're getting the best. Now equipment like the Norden bombsite is an everyday experience to these men. And believe me, every cadet who looks through that eyepiece sees Tokyo below. Like that. Yes, it's a little different for these fellows. They come overseas to train and go home to fight. Hiya, Shang. Hello, Lin. You can't wear out these guys. They fly the clock around, piling up hours, experience, and skill. Their training wasn't in Tennessee with red and blue armies. They trained like all the cadets. On the burning fields of China, the Blue Army was the deadly, efficient Jap war machine. You can't stop these boys. They know the importance of a crack air force, and they didn't learn it from headlines or newsreels. Sure, they're hot on the end of a gun. Why not? They grew up with their forefingers curled around a trigger waiting for a jab to cross their sights. As they saw over our land, they remember the Jap ships that zoomed down at them, strafing their mothers and fathers and brothers. And they remember the whistling of bombs in the sight of their homes and towns in flames. So they fly from sun up to sundown ceaselessly, tirelessly learning, blasting away at the targets, waiting for the day when they can return to China and with the force of the United Nations behind them, hurl themselves against the Japs. These are angry men, but they're free men and they sing of the new world they're making. But in the few hours off, their thoughts, like all soldiers, turn to home, to their family, if they're alive, and to their commander-in-chief, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. Finally, it's graduation day. Proud? You bet. But more than that, take a look at them. There are no smiles on the faces of these men who are going home with a purpose. The wings of the United States Army Air Force to the Air Force of China. That tells the story. And soon these wings will be flashing angrily across the skies of the Far East. Flyers and fighters, every one of them, going back to take up the fight. Their fight and our fight. Start diving for those foxhole soldiers of Japan. Start building those bomb shelters, citizens of Tokyo and Yokohama. These guys have a message for you you'll never forget. So long, fellas. 
give him hell. Anytime anybody tells you an army moves on its stomach, I think you know what to tell him he's full of. An army moves on its feet and you know it. Feet and habit shoes and you know that too. Shoes are a traveling man's home address. But it looks like I'm getting the bums rush from these physicians and surgeons of the cow cow hide at the United States Army Shoe Shop in Beaufort, Georgia, who are salvaging shoe casualties. Sorting according to size, disinfecting, and treating chemically for fungi. While they do their work, I'll do mine. A good shoe is a nice place to stand around in. An effective weapon when attached to a kick. Tough on the outside, homey on the inside. Pleasant to throw and good to eat in a pinch. As far as the army is concerned, once a shoe, always a shoe. No matter how dark and sinful the past of a shoe may be, it gets a bright and hopeful future at this shoe heaven, where wrecked shoes are pulled over the last, rough rounded, rubber stitched, fiber fastened, sole leveled, heel attached, heel shaved, scoured, seated, inked, and burnished. Then they are edge trimmed, side lasted, full crowned, upper trimmed, low inseamed, welt butt and tacked, welt beat and slashed, hard shanked, bottom filled, and sole laid. According to Webster, who had two pairs, a shoe is a covering for the human foot. But Webster wasn't much for poetry and left out a few important details. Bright new shoes like these don't protect the foot alone. They protect the whole man. They give the naked foot a happy destination. The body balance and equilibrium. The spirit a comfortable feeling about the future. A barefooted man never conquered anything outside a bedroom. Sooner or later, a man's got to put on his shoes and truck on down. My dear friend in America, Mrs. Anna Sartoria. Third officer, Wack, New York City. Unexpected pleasure was letter from young woman from America, woman soldier, for which take thanks from the heart. We both wives and mothers, and we must help our men with work. My husband, Boris, he is sergeant in tank corps and two times decorated. I work in factory. It is new working in factory, but we are in war and all for the front. They need it. When factory moved a few hundred kilometers inside beyond Ural Mountains, I too went with my children. All my friends did the same. Some went to mines. My best friend Olga, now a miner. Very many working in hundreds of Russian war factories, making guns and shells even learn how to shoot. My two podrugi, what you say, girlfriend, fight in Red Army. We do what is good for motherland, whether make weapons or use them on Hitler beasts. It's same war for us all. From Boris today, I receive a letter. You must hear it. My little wife, once more we have stopped in our advance and I have time to write. It is no longer cold. Already the green leaves provide good camouflage. We have just eaten. It is good to be alive. Still, as always, we attack. Yesterday, my colonel told us the Red Army defends by incessant attack. Behind us, tank reserves are moving up. Within our lines now is much of the ruined land, still smoking, set on fire by the Germans as they withdrew. Poor fools. They cause so much suffering, so much waste, so much hate, for nothing. 
They are proud that four millions of us already have died defending the motherland. As if we had nothing to die for, Natasha. Like Pyotr Vasilievich's four sons, who when the Hitlerites had taken their village, fought the invaders in the streets with any weapons they could find. They died. And now Russia leaves. My husband, he writes well. The papers say our tanks attack again in this sector. He is back in battle. But he says he is glad, for he knows the importance of what he does every day is still alive. We also behind the lines fighting the same as Russian men and women in trenches. Still, my Boris, he writes, work still harder, Natasha, work still harder. So many in Russia lost their homes, like me, and wait to go back home to peace. For if my Boris is alive, someday he will be great engineer doing much to reconstruct our motherland left in ruins by Nazis. Though already six and a half million Nazis dead or prisoners, still they fight for no good reason, while we fight for every decent reason on earth. They are wrong. We know we are right. <laughs> young fella getting out of that bomber? Just an ordinary young American with a kind of ordinary American name. Levin. My Levin. Born in Brooklyn 26 years ago. They say he wasn't much at school, but he won the Navy Cross just the same. For bringing down a lot of Japanese planes and for sinking a couple of ships, too, with a guy named Kelly. Colin Kelly. This is the last time you're ever going to see Maya, because he's dead now. Knocked out by the Japs. It's a good thing somebody had a voice recording set up out in the Pacific and asked him, what was your most exciting adventure, Maya? Well, I've been on about 50 bombing missions. I think my narrowest escape was when I was flying with Captain Colin P. Kelly in the Philippines. We just sunk the Haruna and we're on our way back to our home base. We were attacked by two Japanese pursuits. They came up from below and behind us, got on our blind spot behind the tail and stayed there. They were throwing everything they had at us, cannon, armor piercing, tracer and incendiary bullets were pouring through the cabin. They set the ship on fire. When the control cables burned through, the pilot called over Interphone and told us to bail out. I got down to the escape hatch and found my navigator, Lieutenant Joe Bean, struggling with the door, trying to get out. Seems that the emergency release had frozen. Well, I realized we didn't have much time to waste, so I kicked the door open with one foot and kicked him out with the other. Then, well, I guess a man gets superhuman strength at times. I tore the door off the hinges and went out with it. Counted eight, pulled my rip cord. Good old shoot blossom. Well, that made me pretty happy for a minute. Picture changed, though, rather quickly. It's two pursuit, shot our plane down, set it on fire, came around and started to strafe us. They made eight separate passes. Tracer bullets coming all around us. Look up at my chute, see them going through. See them going around my legs. One stream of tracers caught my right pant leg and ripped it up to the knee. Managed to get down okay. Guess I'm pretty lucky. I haven't been hit yet. I just learned a secret. It's a honey. It's a pip. But the enemy is listening, so I'll never let it. 
it slip. Because when I learn a secret, boy, I zipper up my lip. Now, the military secret that I carry in my brain, I keep in safe deposit with a padlock and chain. You bet I got a secret. Well, I bet we find it out. The soldier's got a secret, but I bet we find it out. Hello, Ma. I got a secret. I can only drop a tip. Don't bring a word to no one, but I'm going on a trip. Peter Bird to no one, but he's going on a trip. Hey, give me some magazines to read for when I'm on the ship. Don't bring a word to no one, but he's going to go by ship. It's a cinch to keep a secret if a fella just takes care. He's sailing on a troop ship now. We got to find out where. I'm a sound and silent soldier, just as steady as a rock. Here's to my little secret with its chain and pattern lock. Hello, baby. Hiya. So say, say you're a lefty trick. I hope I meet some babes in Africa as kid as you are. <laughs> Sauerkraut. He wonders who in hell it was that let his secret out. <laughs> 